Hey everyone, this is Jay. Today, in this video, we're gonna read the novel we were reading last time. It's called The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle. So in this video, we're gonna start with number three, A Case of Identity. Let's just get into it. My dear fellow, said Sherlock Holmes as we sat on either side of the fire in his long lodgings at Baker Street. Life is infinitely stranger than anything which the mind of man could invent. We would not dare to conceive the things which are really mere common places of existence. If we could fly out of the window hand in hand, hover over this great city, gently remove the roofs and peep in at the queer things which are going on, the strange coincidences, the plannings, the cross purposes, the wonderful chains of events working through generations and leading to the most outer results, it would make a fiction with its convention conventionalities and foreseeing conclusions most stale and unprofitable. And yet, I'm not convinced of it. I answered. The cases which come to the light in the papers are as a rule bad enough and vulgar enough. We have in our police reports realism pushed to its extreme limits. And yet the result is, it must be confessed, neither fascinating nor artistic. A certain selection and discretion must be used in producing a realistic effect, remarked Holmes. This is warning in the police report, which more stress is laid perhaps upon the platitudes of the magistrate than upon the details, which to an observer contain the vital essence of the whole matter. Depend upon it, there is nothing so natural as the commonplace. I smiled and shook my head. I can quite understand your thinking so, I said, of course, in your position and of an official advisor and help, help but to anybody, everybody who is absolutely puzzled throughout three continents, you are brought in contact with all that is strange and bizarre. But here, I picked up the morning paper from the ground. Let us put it into a practical test. Here is the first heading upon which I come, a husband's cruelty to his wife. There is a half a column of print, but I know without reading it that it all it's all perfectly familiar to me. There is, of course, the other women, the drink, the push, the blow, the bruise, the sympathetic sister or landlady. The crudest of writers could invent nothing more crude. Indeed, your example is an unfortunate one for your argument, said Holmes, taking the paper and glancing his eyes down it. This is the Dunda separation case, and as it happens, I was engaged in clearing up some small points in connection with it. The husband was a teetotaler. There was no other women, and the conduct complained of was that he had drifted into the habit of winding up every meal by taking out his false teeth and hurling them at his wife, which she will allow is not an action likely to occur to the imagination of the average storyteller. Take a pinch of snuff, doctor, and acknowledge that I have scored over you in your example. I held out his snuff box of old gold with a great amethyst in the center of the lead. Its splendor was in such contrast to his homely ways and simple life that I could not help commenting upon it. Ah, said he. I forgot that I had not seen you for some weeks. It's a little souvenir from the King of Bohemia in the return for my assistance in the case of the Irina Adler papers. And the ring? I asked, uh, glancing at the remarkable brilliant which sparkled upon his finger. It was from the reigning family of Holland. Though the manner in which I served them was of such delicacy that I cannot confide it even to you. Who? have been good enough to chronicle one or two of my little problems. And have you any on hand just now? I asked with interest. Some ten or twelve, but none which presented any for any feature of interest. They're important, you understand, without being interesting. 
Indeed, I have found that it is usually in unimportant matters that there is a field for the observation and for the quick analysis of cause and effect which gives us charm to an investigation. The larger crimes are apt to be the simpler, but the bigger the crime is the more obvious. As a rule, is the motive. In this case, save for the one rather intricate matter which has been referred to me from Marcellus, there is nothing which presents any features of interest. It is possible, however, that I may have something better before very many minutes are over. For this is one of my clients, or I am as much mistaken. He had risen from his chair and was standing between the parted blinds, gazing down into the dull, neutral, tinted London street. Looking over his shoulder, I saw that on the pavement opposite, there stood a large woman with a heavy fur bow around her neck and a large curling red feather in a, in a broad-brimmed hat which was tilted in, in a coquettish co duchess of uh, Devonshire fashion over her ear. From under this panoply, she peeped up in a nervous, hesitating fashion at her windows while her body oscillated backward and forward, and her fingers fidgeted with her glove buttons. Suddenly, with a plunge, as of the swimmer who leaves the bank, she hurried across the road, and we heard the sharp clang of the bell. I have seen those symptoms before, said Holmes, throwing his cigarette into the fire. Oscillation upon the pavement always means an effort to occur. She would like advice, but is not sure that the matter is not too delicate for communication. And yet, even here, we make discriminate. When a woman has been seriously wronged by a man, she has no longer oscillates, and the usual symptom is a broken bell wire. Here we may take it that there is a love matter, but that the maiden is not so much angry as perplexed, grieved. But here she comes in person to resolve her doubts. As he spoke, there was a tap at the door, and the boy in buttons entered to announce Miss Mary Sutherland, while the lady herself loomed behind his small black figure like a full sail merchant man behind a tiny pilot boat. Sherlock Holmes welcomed her with the easy courtesy for which she was remarkable, and having closed the door and bowed her into an armchair, he looked her over in the minute and yet abstracted fashion which was peculiar to him. Do you not find, he said, that with your short sight it's little trying to do so much typewriting? I did at first, she answered, but now I know where the letters are without looking. Then suddenly realizing that the full purport of his words, he gave a violence she gave a violent start and looked up with fear and astonishment upon her broad, good humoured face. You've heard about me, Mr Holmes? She cried, how else, how else could you know all that? <laughs> Never mind, said Holmes, laughing. <laughs> it's my business to know things. Perhaps I have trained myself to see what others overlook. If not, why should you come to consult me? I came to you, sir, because I heard of you from Mrs. Etheridge, whose husband uh, found so easy when the police and everyone had given him up for dead. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I wish you would do as much for me. I'm not rich, but still I have a hundred a year in my own right. Besides the little that I make by the machine, and I, I would give it all to know what has become of Mr. Holmes or Angel. Why did you come away to consult me in such a hurry? asked Sherlock Holmes with his fingertips together and his eyes to the ceiling. Again, a startled look came over the somewhat vacuous face of Miss Mary Sutherland. Yes, I did not bang out of the house, she said, uh, for it made me angry to see uh, the easy way in which Mr. Windybank, that is my father, took it all. He would not go to the police, and he would not go to you, uh, and so I said at last, as he would do nothing and kept on saying that there was no harm done, it made me mad, and I just on with my things and came right away to you. Your father, said Holmes. Your stepfather, surely, since the name is different. 
Yes, my stepfather. I call him father, though it sounds funny too, for he's only five years and two months older than me. And your mother is still alive. Oh yes, mother is alive and well, and I was in best place, Mr. Holmes. When she married again, um, so soon after father's death, and a man who was nearly 15 years younger than herself. Father was a plumber in the Tottenham Court Road, and he left a tidy business behind him, which mother carried on with Mr. Hardy, the, uh, the foreman. But when Mr. Windybank came, he made us sell the business, for he was very superior, being a traveler for in wines. They got... 4,700 pounds for the goodwill and interest, which was near as much as father could have got if he had been alive. Alright everyone, that's it for today. Don't forget to subscribe and watch the whole video if you can. And as always, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.